Well, and it's Maura Gamble from Our Permaculture Life, and I'm here in Koran today with Dan Dayton. And um, we've been trying to make this garden tour work for a long time. There's been yeah. rains and floods and all sorts of things, but finally we're here, and um, you're in for a treat because it's a beautiful garden with so much to see, and particularly really relevant in terms of what you can do in um, suburban landscape. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Maura, and thanks for the opportunity. I feel um, privileged you know, and honoured to have you here after to, no, I know. Yeah, so it's wonderful to have um, you here and for the opportunity to be able to show you around and share our garden with yeah. you. Yeah, um, looking forward to it. So, yeah. so you've got so many bits and pieces we're going to have a look at. What I might do is just turn the camera around and we'll just follow Dan around his garden and uh, see what he's got and, and ask questions as we go. So yeah, okay. So thanks for good. having me. I'm an urban animal, so <laughs> I've come from Wollongong. I love small gardens and small gardens aren't barriers for um, doing thinking big and and feeling part of the big picture so I feel that having a small garden I can um, gives me time to to really make it beautiful and productive and um, but also have time to do other things out in the world so if we can make it work in our backyard then scale it up into streets neighborhoods suburbs um, cities whole you know regions and nations and yeah the work starts we can trial and error it all here in our backyard and that's what I love about it <laughs> Well, yeah, welcome everyone to our garden. Um, this is my home garden and my partner Sue McGregor and um, my sister-in-law and her partner Sandra and Rod. Um, yeah, we've been here for 12 years, oh, since 2012 and we, um, yeah, first up just like to acknowledge that we are on, um, yeah, Kabi Kabi and Gabi Gabi country and um, just acknowledge that, yeah, we're, the, we're, we're yeah, temporary caretakers of this land and really um, honour those who have come before us and, and, uh, and, and are still here and this, yeah, this land is, um, yeah, it feels more and more. I feel that anyway that it's in, that um, that we are part of that, and so feel very fortunate to be here, um, rather than being a slave so much to huge acreage. So it's hard enough looking after. Not hard enough, but there's a lot of work to do for a small block. So um, for example, right here we've got a a giant clumping bamboo, um, tropical bamboo, Gigantochloa atta. It's um, it's still young, uh, it's probably yeah, close to 10 years old now and you can see the new combs are, are getting quite s substantially in their size. If, if it's managed annually then you can um, keep it compact, keep it small and make good use of the, the products and services that it provides which is beautiful uh, structural timbers to uh, fantastic edible shoots and um, lots of craft material and, and, and the sheer beauty of it, just having these elegant, gorgeous, magnificent plants in an urban, um, our urban environment, I think, in, well, it inspires me and I think it, it, yeah, it can spark that wonder and awe in nature. And so a good friend of mine, actually, Steve Dillon from Wollongong, he talked about um, little end nature and big end nature. And so we can, big end being wilderness and national parks and our home gardens, can be little ends, so little ponds, little um, little wild areas, little bits of agriculture, and um, little animal systems, little composting systems. And let's face it, most uh, most people on the planet now are living in cities. So I don't know what the percentage is, but more and more, we humanity is um, living in big suburbs, big cities, and that's where the challenge is for us all as permies and design planners, designers, community development workers, whatever it is that we do. Um, yeah, if we can make it work in our backyard then scale it up into streets, neighborhoods, suburbs, um, cities, whole you know regions and nations then yeah the work starts. We can trial and error it all here in our backyard and that's what I love about it. <laughs> Yeah, one thing about urban environments is, um, as you just know, as we've come from shade into sun, is this thing, um, uh, this concept of microclimate. So, as planners and designers, we always thinking about what the global patterns are or the master patterns. So, what are the sun paths um, that govern us that don't change? So, winter, summer, autumn, and spring kind of sun 
um, pass in terms of the, you know, the, the angle on the horizon and the angle in the sky. So that doesn't change, but what does change from place to place is the, the dance between the big pattern and then um, land form and um, as what way the land's facing and existing trees and buildings and fence lines and so on. So in suburbia and cities, and it's really important to observe that what the microclimate is. So we're in this lovely, nice winter sunny spot here, but just a couple of metres away in the shade. So if we tune into that, we can start to um, match up our needs, plant needs, animal needs, and so on with um, what the sun is doing and the shadow patterns that get created. This is um, a repurposed rainwater, it was from the tip basically, uh, found it at the tip and the, the lid had been busted but it's still otherwise is all intact so I grabbed that and then um, I have a, a really wonderful, uh, really wonderful human being, Mr Ng Kok Hong, who um, uh, he is a, a, an amazing um, aquaculturalist, freshwater ecology, um, uh, assist, like water ecologist, but also a brilliant artist, by a Malaysian um, uh, man, and uh, I was lucky enough to meet him in the early 2000s and were, and became great friends. And so in here we've got one of his biofilters. Um, I've just finished setting it up, and essentially it's a gravel bed at the bottom of the pond, and there's a pump um, in this tube here that's down the bottom, and it's drawing water off the floor of the pond and then returning that water to the top. And yeah, Ung made it. Uh, this is one of his designs, yeah. So he's, um, so the, the idea is that, uh, oh, the, the, the system is based on uh, keeping really high levels of oxygen, dissolved oxygen in the water by removing the, keeping the water moving off the floor, um, bringing it back to the top and then down, then it draws back down through the gravel bed the high levels of dissolved oxygen in the water keep the um, bacteria alive, the aerobic bacteria that live underwater, and they um, manage the nitrogen cycle and convert the wastes uh, from, say, de decomposing organic matter in the water to fish waste and into a form that then is um, useful then and healthy back for the aquatic environment. So the plants stay healthy, the fish stay healthy. And so it's a little mini version that I'm, yeah, wanting to stock this now with native fish and, and then, um, yeah, and then, yeah, Ng's work is amazing in Asia. And uh, so I'd he, he makes swimming pools out of this system right through to um, aquaculture systems for, for home, the home, for food production. Literally, he has his ponds next to the kitchen window and over there, he'll just flick out the window, all the food waste into the ponds and then the, the range of tropi native tropical fish from that region that he's um, fascinated with and promoting as well, he can demonstrate the, 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 uh, the, the value of native species rather than the often promoted exotic tilapias and carps and so on that have ravaged the natural environment and just like here too we have exotic fish that have been introduced that have, have decimated native species so yeah it's a way again a little n example of little n nature and i've got these um beautiful aquatics that harvested from locally this eelgrass that's doing really well and that will that i can bring that up and show you so that's just started from tiny little cuttings, uh, little divisions, and now um, it's just growing in a little, a little pot of sand and gravel. And then that, that's over, this probably a metre long almost they'll grow, they're close to it. And I've just got that sitting in the water down there. And then another little um, fool around system I'm working with is these, inspired by Peter Nolan from down in Wollongong, these basket gardens. So. In there I've got this, um, it's a native submerged aquatic called Water Time and they're, they're just f attached to glass and shells and um, ceramics that are inside this basket and because it's a proper f submerged aquatic it can grow in deep water too. I'm just hanging that and then by hanging it in the water it's creating beautiful habitat for the fish I can easily manage the, the, the volume of the biomass if it gets too much. 
and it's the idea is this underwater garden that I want to keep um, to get going so that if we do put native fish in containers um, we make it interesting for them it's not just this um, yeah void that they're swimming around and around in yeah the other bit about this is permaculture principle can't remember the number but integrate rather than segregate so we've got the down pot the gutters from the roof down to the down pipe into a rainwater tank that's when that's full it then overflows into a pond when the pond is full that overflows into the garden when the soil has saturated then the surf then the water then only then does the water then start flowing away and off the property so the whole idea is to utilize um, that resort catch and store that resource and that energy um, and use it as many times as possible or work with it rather than using it to create um, all sorts of possibilities other than it rather than it coming down the pipe and straight down to the curb and gutter and down the drain so this can fit beautifully into the city's a city courtyard garden or a backyard suburban garden um, very small footprint but yeah I'd say that um, it, it's um, so much to so much benefits and so much value in these little 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 system and I, I find myself coming out here every day now just checking on it oh how's my little new plants going and seeing the yeah being just being mesmerized and the, I think that I more and more I think that elements like this um, are fundamental to wellness at home in, at work at school and so we could create these systems where people can come and sit and play and it's very tactile and, um, and ideally we could get in them if we like, you know, to have them scale them up so we can get in them or put our feet into them. And, but yeah, it's, it's a, a nice way to reconnect with the moment and, um, and that these plants are all, um, have that ability really and, and animals and the insects, whatever, they have the ability to get us back, come back now and be present. Yeah, from our busy lives and busy minds. We've got um, like miracle fruit here and sour salt there. So yeah, again, um, microclimate here, example of microclimate, we've got a shade loving South American fruit tree, um, the miracle fruit. Its habit is so lovely. It's very compact and can grow quite tall and slender. It's happy, very happy in this um, full shade of winter in summer and spring and autumn it gets sun but it does a lot of the South American fruits will do really well in um, shade and part shade part sun so great again for urban environments and then on the other side here where there's definitely more sun most of the year round is um, a more tropical Southeast Asian tropical the sour sop or I think that's the common name for it um, and it's like a custard apple but um, more of a Southeast Asian version of that. And yeah, integrating bananas. Um, there's grey water coming into this area here. So we do integrate the kitchen grey water with the garden. And this um, tree fern here was planted as a seedling 10 years ago and already it's towering and it doesn't look like stopping. And that's, um, and, and the banana are, li are receiving every day the, we have just washing up in the sink. You can see under here there's a there's a worm farm that sits under the house. So that that's the, that's been running now. Um, this little model here has been here for probably close to ten years as well. Essentially, worms, the compost worms, they love wet environments and like to be you know a constant supply of organic matter, food waste. If they, if it's so, it's not, it doesn't matter. It can be super saturated, but not flooded. And so this is super saturated. And if I could get in there and show you, I'd love to. But each one of these trays now has a permanent high-rise apartment living for thousands of compost worms. And the top tray is more active, where food waste is coming in, and they'll be coming up and down, and constantly um, breaking that down. The washing through of the water somehow, I'm well not somehow, but does tend to mean that, and there's not a lot of food waste coming through, but just enough so that it doesn't really need ever emptying out. And I'd, I've, now we just don't touch these bottom three. If anything, we just do a bit of servicing of the top, maybe once a year. But I actually want to get that out of there into the garden so that I can get to it. So I'm going to 
yeah, send a, send a pipe there and then have that sitting rather than on legs. Yeah, an easier way, even better way to do this is have the whole thing sitting in a drum and have the whole drum full of wood chip and have ho lots of holes in the bottom so the water goes through the layers, out the bottom, through all the wood chip in the drum and then through the bottom of the drum via, you know, lots of little holes if that makes sense, just straight into the soil. And now uh, we've got these in schools and they've been going really well. They're, 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 they're literally that last version I talked about, just a tray system in a big drum of wood chip. Two rules are um, wipe before you wash, so tr don't overload your system with grease and fats. So just paper towel that and put that in the compost, which is good practice anyway because folks living a million si citizen in a city washing down animal fats, vegetable fats down the drain causes, um, wreaks havoc at the sewage system, um, sewage works. So it's good to get that off and compost it anyway. So just wipe before you wash um, the greases and oils and then otherwise all the bits of food scraps can wash, go down the gut, down the drain. And don't pour your boiling water past a hot, you know, down, let it cool a little bit. It's not hard, just they're the only really, the only two things that we do. And otherwise it's, um, you know, it gets, it gets drenched numerous times a day from um, washing up in the morning, maybe a little bit at lunchtime and in the evening. Out here, so you, all I've got is a flexible, it's just a flexible laundry hose. And then um, I haven't looked under here for so long, but <laughs> it's under there. Um, and that, that should be um, going into like an open mulch fill basin, but it's, it's literally, as soon as you start putting the water there, worms start coming in and creating de this lovely um, organic matter that's castings and ground mixed up with soil and plant roots get in. So essentially, yeah, the, the, the back end of it is the water's going into a mulched fill basin. And that way you can easily just um, check on it annually and then clear out a little bit or um, add a bit more wood chip. It's, it's exactly the same system for the grey water. If you can see through there for the, for the, um, the shower, the shower, um, shower water um, just goes into a box with, and then out of that box are as many outlets as you want and each outlet goes to a fruit tree mulch fill basin. This whole system comes from a fella named Art Ludwig and he's, he wrote a, an amazing book called The um, Grey Water Oasis. And so I kind of adapted what he did, but he used that, those boxes and even this would be classed as a grey water diversion device. And so you just divide up your, um, separate your waters, keep your kitchen water separate from your laundry and that separate from your, your shower because they're, they're all funky and they're all different, have different things in them. So don't mix your potentially high soap, salt loaded laundry water with high quality fresh water from a shower and then high organic loads kitchen water. It's like really simple but um, you, it's quite, um, yeah, like it's, it's, it's smart, you know, it's simple, a smart kind of, and totally can retrofit the suburbs with this. I, I've been doing these since the early 90s and they, they haven't failed yet, you know, so yeah. yeah so that, that's a native plant that, yeah, I would have thought might not like that much nutrient or, but it can handle, obviously it's loving the water. Um, and I'm not kidding, it is, was a seedling from a nursery that we, you know, a young tree fern. And um, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a trunk now that's, oh yeah, I, I, I think, I can imagine this will keep going. Yeah, just going to keep growing to the light, so. <laughs> oh, here's our um, hanging gardens. I love these little, um, little systems. So yeah. Just noticing how bromeliads grow, they, they don't, they're, they're epiphytes, they live, on the, they live in the air and they really don't need any soil and so, um, you know, I started making these out of metal a long time ago and like that one there's, you can see there, it's, I, hammered, started, I hammered some old corrugated iron to, for it and it, they work really well but it, it's fun but it's quite, takes a lot longer takes a while so
bit by bit I've been using scrap plastic and scrap wire. Um, like the, you'll have people, I'm sure, will have bits of like just scraps of wire that you can just. I call, started calling them Christmas cones because I give them, <laughs> I give them out for for Christmas and um, presents and have kind of ver various versions of them, but. Yeah, again, in a nat small spaces, we, we can reduce the scale of buildings or structures um, and create green walls without, you know, just, just by um, creating a surface for them to hang off, yeah. Um, well, this used, to be the <laughs> this used to be the fence line to the neighbours. Um, when the previous owners sold and moved on, our sister, um, or sister-in-law, my sister-in-law, Sue's sister moved up from Melbourne and her partner Rod and um, we, we pu pulled down the fence basically. So the fence part, the fence included this wall of uh, an old shed and um, this old shed just had one in and out, just a doorway. It was very dark and dingy and became a place, I don't know about your places, but for me, those kind of spaces you get filled up with stuff. And so after a very long time um, of, of frustration, realised that, wow, it might be, maybe it's possible to repurpose this. Um, my, a great friend and wonderful builder, Al Geimer from Koran, he come up and said, yeah, it's not a knockdown, Dan, just, um, we'll just, you know, we'll just, uh, we'll keep it honest, he said. And so, yeah, just took out the wall and put in, um, yeah, openings either side, extended the roof so that when we do get that really tropical, those east coast lows and um, driving rain from every direction, we've got somewhere now to um, hang the clothes, get out of the rain. And so now this, where it used to be a fence and a block to, um, to this aspect and this sunlight and to these people, our, our neighbours, now is this lovely connective strategy where um, we can you know, cascade down the tire steps to, 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 you know, to cut across, shortcut through the garden and it's a place to make stuff and hang out, it's a place to dry clothes and, and um, get out of the hot sun as well, it catches the breeze. So again, there's so much potential to turn our um, our fenced-in neighbourhoods into these connected um, communities, and obviously it's it's a conversation. And it needs to be negotiated, but there's so many um, potential benefits by doing that. And if we can make it work for each other, yeah, mm. yeah. Tires, um, tire steps. We've started doing these in the schools in Wollongong. Yeah, I should mention um, Aaron Sorensen, my my um, dear friend and colleague, and business partner together we've um, been working together since 2003 on school programs the living classroom project in that started in the Warrawong community of schools and it was down there that two of these elements in particular these tire um, steps we started um, using this method or, of building with young people in schools to um, manage steep slopes to to in response to the movement patterns of children in school, young people in school. So uh, Warrawong High, for example, very steep slope. Um, we were contour path, creating contour paths and to be able to get across these really steep slopes. But the students, the young people wanted to go straight down the hill. So they'd like literally be jumping and bashing down the hill. And so we realized, yeah, in addition to these contour paths that we need to make it easy to move through the landscape you need a snakes and ladders approach too so you can get down from one level to the next and and um, these tires are very they're excellent um, building building um, units they they don't break down well very very fast um, certainly a lot slower than what they do if they're on the car um, burning rubber on roads so they're quite stable in the environment I wouldn't put them in my veggie garden but as the steps in the landscape, they're really, um, they're, I think it's appropriate. And then um, you'll see here the seeding circles that evolved out of the Living Classroom project as well. So again, in a school, we want to be able to um, bring, peop bring the students together in a way that, um, that they can 
start to learn how to create a culture of, of working together as a team. So, of course, traditionally, all traditional, traditionally across cultures, the circle has been a, uh, a very effective way for people to come together um, socially or um, for a council of elders. And so this is one quarter of a full circle. And in the inner schools, we do a three-quarter circle like this. And I've got six, six pairs of ties here. So in the school, we have, um, we'd have um, 20 pairs of tyres. So there's, there's, there's 12 tyres in this, there's 40 tyres in a seating circle. An average person over a lifetime might use, have, go through at least 40 tyres over you know, 40 years of driving maybe, I don't know, something like that. But we figured out if everyone used about 20 to 40 tyres in their garden, then that would, make, that would offset their tyres going to land, not landfill anymore, but you know what I mean? So um, it's a great way for us to uh, repurpose a material that's got more than um, a life just as a tyre, so we're giving it a different life. What do you put inside them here? Are they just stacked? Uh, they're core filled, so um, I, ideally you'd, you'd fill it from the soil on your site. Um, but in schools where we're working with students, for example, to build them, uh, if you're working with really heavy clays, that's really challenging. So we often core fill it with crushed, um, like crusher dust, uh, recycled concrete. But um, depending on the context, uh, they, but they, yeah, they're, they're core filled. The trick is to get low profile tyres, they have a very narrow um, wall so they're quite rigid yeah, and, um, and then screw them that way through the, through the walls like internally and then also through the treads with um, old roofing screws so that it doesn't need, you know, the, the, the building t method is, is low tech so um, anyone can do it and then the construction method for this is all based on geometry, using a story rod, and proper carpentry skills that are, again, um, teachable and transferable to young people and adults. So, yeah, there's a great, uh, wonderful cartoon artist, Max Banner, who lives up here on the Sunshine Coast, in, in Boring Point, actually. He's illustrated all the steps, so we're, we've, um, we need some help putting that, his illustrated drawings together with the photographs and um, and making a nice little booklet and making it available to anyone to be able to do it. So, yeah, some of that kind of, there's only so much, you know, we can all do. So if anyone wants to help out with that one. <laughs> yeah. That's a good call yeah. to action. Fantastic. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of te really practical, technical guides, I think, mm. is so useful, yeah. so helpful. Yeah, because yeah. to look at it, it looks like, oh, who's going to build that for me? But actually, um, it's totally doable for anyone to have to build these well and yeah. the story rod is has all the information on it and so you can't go wrong you know what's when, a story rod tell us what a story yeah rod is. Uh, and again Al Geimer and even before him Alex Happer one of our students um, introduced us to you you get a piece of st a piece of timber and all of the measurements go onto the timber and that becomes like a template so where a construction method has a, a, a repetition or like each of those pieces of timber has to be the same as the one before rather than like Aaron and I were doing measuring it out and using a tape and a string line every single time you get a nice story right a piece of timber that's set to the the center of the circle so it's like a, a big compass arm and on that arm it has the, the the lengths and the information and once it's all on there you don't need to think about it anymore so you just follow the the story rod so the story rod keeps the is the keeper of the story and tells the story of how the job gets built and it's also a way of then passing on the story and so it go, it's a it's a carpenter's i guess tradition that's how they built keeps the story alive and the story for the, there is a story to this where it all came from who started it was an Aaron and I like there was Andrew Stanger who developed the who had the, the had the vision another friend Permi and landscape architect to instead of putting planks long ways he said you know cut them radially you know and have them like spokes going into the middle that way you can use smaller pieces of wood and it's more elegant you can show off the geometry and the it's um much more beautiful but it's has a 
it tells a lot more too, you know, um, in terms of building that way, ideally. So have you created this in your garden as a space where you, you host workshops? Yes, yes. So we have, um, I, I run a, a, um, a weekly class, not here all the time now, but we go to other people's gardens. But yeah, the idea is to, that um, if I do have a little workshop here or visitors, it, it's multi, it has that function of being able to sit down and gather and... Um, yeah, you get yeah as part of the workshop. Well, can we take a look at your garden now? Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> your vegetable garden, like the yeah. is all the garden. Yeah, back to what we were talking about before about microclimates. Um, you can see the microclimate here is the winter sun, and over there is winter shade. Out north is towards the clothesline there. So um, at this time of year, half the garden is shaded out by the neighbours trees and it's not till after 10 o'clock that that low winter sun angle actually uh, can get into our vegetable garden so we do have a shorter um, window of sunlight in winter but most of the year it's full sun and this is a garden also at the edge of a forest garden so when we came here there were already many existing large trees and so there was never a lot of scope for a full sun vegetable garden on our place so when Sandra and Rod moved in yeah we pulled down the fence which would have been where the back of this garden is here We're connecting through to the shelter and and connected our forest garden to their lawn and turned the lawn into the shared food garden and um, so our place Sandra and Rod's and Cheryl and Chris who live next door all share this garden so there's a gate into Cheryl and Chris's place and they harvest and bring their compost food waste over and yeah we're always and we we're friends so we help each other out as neighbours and friends as well and the way this garden is set up is um, based on again work with Aaron Sorensen in Wollongong we um, we we um, in schools we've we started doing keyhole beds you know the classic permaculture approach and uh, the Cringilla garden, the first one, we put these little keyholes and oh, it looks so sweet and nice on the plan, but within weeks they were no longer keyholes. They, the keyhole didn't stop the kids from going straight through and to the other side. So we had to re reshape our beds into long beds. And um, in a school garden, the, the width of the beds are 1.2 metres wide, which is like a handshake. When two kids stand together, they can kind of um, shake hands and then squat like frogs and reach to the middle of the bed and that's how we worked out the width. And, but at the home garden I, th I feel it's too wide for, for a home garden and so I've narrowed my beds down based on a friend here, Margaret, who's one of the best home gardeners I've met and she, all, when we looked at her gardens, I've met her through my garden program that I was running We'd go to her garden, it was like always the best garden and always the most productive. And we noticed that her beds just had this seemingly perfect ratio of 80 centimetres wide and for the bed and 40 centimetres for the path. And so I started transitioning from 1.2s down to that. And now I've pretty much got all my beds at that 800. The reason I like it is that um, I can actually I can actually straddle, I can stand over the bed like that if I need to and access it. I can um, definitely reach the middle of the bed. And even though that where they're 800 wide, because we do this um, mound, the surface area is still one metre. So it's easy to work out one square metre of garden for um, your compost. So we put like 10 litres of compost per one square metre uh, or um, for remineralizing, we know how many grams per square meter of the lime and different trace elements. So, it's 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 it works on many on those well on that. And then the other thing is that if I was to dig right down here to the bottom of this pathway, I'd need a fork because it's already gummed up with worm castings in the really old wood chip. The 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 garden shaped like a wave, so building up the beds to increase these permanent beds that get deeper and deeper, the soil, and then going down with the path to deep mulch with wood chip so that when it's really hot, the plants 
and dry. The plants in the middle of the bed, they're never too far away from this well, this really moist path that's full of moist, decomposing organic matter. And being wood chip is more fungal dominant, so you have vegetables growing in bacterial dominated soil with some fungi right next to fungal dominant uh, wood chip paths. They're like bridges between the two gardens and um, so it's like a, uh, a mycelium bridge for example um, and the whole thing's connected so the top bed is connected to the bottom bed via these mulch pathways so worms literally which are kind of like the buses of the neighbourhood can pick up microbes in a bed, travel across the path, deposit them there, pick up another batch and start moving microbes around. Whereas they wouldn't be able to if it was timber edged or just um, dirt paths, for example. So yeah, that's part of the rationale for it. And um, I think definitely keeping them closer together makes it more robust, more resilient to the hot, dry weather. I think I, I, I really love this approach that you've got and it's considering the garden as one whole big garden yeah. as opposed to a series of beds That's in a way. And, yes. And yeah. just that conceptual flip in our garden spaces I think makes all the difference. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's all the, the, uh, seeing a sense that it's one garden, one soil, all interconnected and, um, and working together. And then these beds then connect up to the forest. So... Uh, those beds over there then run into the contour and uh, in the shaded part back there where the vegetables transition to bananas and, and fruit trees but yeah so going and th they become wider those beds but yeah the idea is to try and like a na in nature you have these transition from one ecosystem to the next and where they are they're called like an ecotone and ecotones are like the most more diverse where you've got two ecosystems meeting and species crossing over at, in that ecotone. So we want to, yeah, try and mimic that. Yeah. Uh, a great way to plan your vegetable garden is with family planning. If you look at, say, this crop here, the, the carrots, the family that carrots are in, uh, one name for that family is the umbiliferae. So the first part, umbel, means in Latin umbrella and the furre at the end, or sometimes it's ACA, means family. So this is the umbrella family. And so I've got my umbrella family here. Over here we've got broccoli and cauliflower. One of the names for that family is cruciferae, so cruci, ACA, cruciferae. So cruci being cross. So there's the cross family. Each bed has a main crop, and then amongst the main crop, are, are far, the main crop might be f slow growing and, and then so it might take a couple of months at least before we're harvesting ca uh, broccoli and cauliflower. So then we're filling in the gaps with fast growing short lived uh, plants such as Asian greens and lettuces and we've got parsley in gaps so that while we're waiting for the, the slow growing main crop we can be harvesting um, quick pick greens for example and there we have for here if we've got lettuce it's a different family parsley is a different family to the main crops there so there you can start to mix the families up and and do a bit of companion planning and the other thing that we'd like to do is every third bed or so we have like a cover strip that's a perennial bed it's narrower so um, in my, sp I don't have a lot of space, so you can keep them a bit narrow or make it the same width of your main bed if you have the room. And in there, we've got comfrey as a permanent growing plant that we can chop and drop and return to our garden bed. So we're cycling the comfrey, cycling nutrients and minerals. We harvest the leaves and return them back into the vegetable bed at the beginning of every new um, crop seed. So twice a year, for example. And then in amongst that we'll have flowers like marigolds and buckwheat and, and a, um, we've got daikon radish and so you could uh, borage in there so you can put uh, lucerne and play around, mix it up so that this is a, these, these cover strips function not only for biomass or returning biomass back into the garden but they're there for habitat for 
the yeah, beneficial bugs, yeah, pollinators, for example. And there's always some always some habitat there for for those for those insects, as well as the cycling of nutrients. I noticed you also have lots of flowers around. I just noticed your beautiful roses yes. here and yep yeah. gerberas. Yeah, the gerberas are lovely. I uh, I think that they're um, they're great to bookend. The ends of beds are great with comfrey and flowers. You can, as, yeah, you can come in through here, you can see, yeah, a new crop again. So here we've got the main crop of the chards are there. So that's the chenopode. So chenopode, chenopode means cheno for goose, pody foot, so the goose foot family. So it's, not, it's kind of fun to remember the family name. So this is the goose foot family bed. And then in between it, I've got parsley, which is from the umbrella family lettuce from the aster family and Asian greens from the cross family. So we have got four families in one bed, the main crop being the slow growing and I, we can harvest these quick growing um, plants from different families for that companioning of benefit. And likewise here, the, we've got beetroots and at the edges, um, coriander and dill. Likewise here, broad beans, so there's your Papillionaceae, so the butterfly family is the main crop and then again amaranth and um, bok choys and lettuces to be harvesting food while we're waiting for the months yeah, ahead. How often are you planting, Dan? Well, uh, twice a year, so try and do this, the autumn planting um, starting around March right through to now, June, and try and have it all done by then and then come September right through to November plant, so twice a year. So twice a year these beds will be, um, will be revamped and, and like with minerals and compost and depending on the, the crop, so here is just what we call the Simply Om, Simply Organic Matter method. So we're just putting 10 litres of compost per square metre into the soil plus the remineralizing with the minerals that we need for this soil. What do, you, what do you use for minerals? We've been getting our soils tested. Um, as it turns out, this particular soil is from a type of rock that's very low in calcium and it's not the best agricultural soil. So um, we have to return, we've got to build the um, calcium up. It's got too much magnesium, so most soils don't need dolomite. They, because it's got magnesium and calcium in it. Most soils will benefit from either a, lime, a calcium, uh, uh, agricultural lime, which is just the calcium, or a gypsum, which is calcium, it's got a bit of sulfur in it, which is beneficial too. So we, that's specific to our soil. And then the pattern around here is that um, things that stick to the organic matter, like silica and boron, for example, they wash off easily wherever you have high rainfall climates. So a general rule of thumb for anywhere in this region would be that high rainfall would mean constant leaching or washing away of boron and silica because they, they live on the organic matter, they're anions. And, um, and so most soils are, are deficient in those. So we, we put a little bit of that back in plus things, a whole bunch of other trace elements um, that, yeah, I, I think that it's a great journey for people to get on to because, um, yeah, missing minerals in the soil mean missing minerals in the plants, which that, that's the driver for disease and pests and in uh, attacking the plants and then missing minerals in the plants is missing minerals in us and animals and so we end up the, the driver of disease in people too, a big one is mineral deficiencies. So rather than taking a mineral magnesium supplement, give that to the soil, let the microbes turn it into a biological magnesium and it's far more available to us through the plants and animals that we're harvesting from the soil than taking supplements. So um, my, our garden should be true. If, we, if we're gonna have a home garden, make it truly nourishing. Make it like, so when I'm putting minerals out now, it's kind of like I'm, um, I'm doing some kind of, um, yeah, nutritional. No, it's, I, I started to see it like when I'm putting rock dust and minerals out, this, this, um, this remineralizing side is really just as important as the organic matter and it's 
yeah, it's it's um, the bit that we don't. It's hardest. It's the hardest part to know what to do, but it doesn't take long to learn what you need to do around all that. And it's um, fundamental to really, truly nourishing food. So, in addition to that simply om method of soil building, the ten liters of organic compost and minerals, and a light light layer of straw, we have the second method is our the Esther Dean, uh, Ruth Stout inspired no dig method. So we now call it a worm lasagna. So it's it's a layer of layering a lasagna layer of, of brown carbon straws and greens like the arrowroot, uh, the arrowroot that we've chopped there. And then below that another layer of straw, and below that another layer of greens, which is an old cover crop. And then each layer gets peppered with compost to inoculate it and um, straws get doused in the magic potion which we're going to show you how to make and that's a, for a heavy feeding crop like um, a big crop of cabbages for example now or a big crop of eggplants in summer or corn so we try and we, so heavy feeding crops get that light feeding crops like carrots and beetroot would get the simply on method and then always um, give the beds uh, at least, you know, try once a year um, an, uh, an annual cover crop or green manure, which to just again to help build soil um, life, soil structure, soil organic matter. It's the best way to build soils because it's the most, it's the least effort, the least resource intensive and it's scalable over large landscapes as well, whereas this is a lot of work. Um, and yeah, you couldn't do a whole acre of this on your own, it would be challenging, but you could do acres of this and get the same result after a few years. What are you growing in there? Um, there's, in a cover crop, there's, there's a, always at least three different types. We've got like a, the brassica, the cruciferae family, the legume family, those beans or peas, a grass, the grass family and there'll be um, sunflowers, in, depending on the type of you, time of year. This is probably a bit more of an su old summer mix that I've thrown out. Yeah, so... So what's your process? Once you've, they've got growing like this, how long do you let them grow for before you...? The general rule is once they, if they start flowering, um, then they start to... Re yeah, it's best to cut it before they flower if you want to maximise the, the, the greenness and all the nitrogen and trace elements in there, you cut it just before they flower and then chop and just chop and, and drop, really. I, I chop and stock, so chop it, stockpile it, aerate, compost, then put it back on and then cover it up. So, um, but yeah, you don't need to pull it out like that. Um, just <laughs> cut it like you're going to the barbers and then aerate with your fork, and put some compost and put it back on and cover it up enough. Yeah. And, and back on this garden, how long will you wait oh, until you plant? I could, pl I could plant it. now. So I would just go through and do this burrowing like a b and get a nice pocket. And then I'll, I'll um, just loosen that with my mini, little mini fork and then put in a, a couple of handfuls of compost to bring the levels up and then plant in there. And this really dramatically drops off. Like it, it looks so bulky now, but um, by the end of the crop, it's literally all gone. You have a beautiful uh, liquid fertilizer, yeah. magic. Yeah, uh, I do. I want to show you how to use worm castings to turn it into vermi wash, um, and uh, which is far more, um, yeah, the, it's the most superior way of using worm castings compared to, to say, the liquid. So we'll do that. We'll go harvest some worm castings, and then we'll mix it up into um, and a drum over here. And, it's a way of fertilizing your vegetables. Yeah, maybe you know, once, every, once a month you could do this. Um, or once every fortnight if, yeah, if it's a really peak growing season, like in summer. Who else lives in this little There's space? There's all the chooks out here and the ducks. The chooks and ducks? Yeah. How many? Uh, There's 10 chooks. And, and they are? Um, four ducks, yeah. Nice. And yeah. there's their bathtub with all their feathers. Yeah, yeah. So, Here's the standard worm farms. As you can see, uh, I've got multiple trays. Start putting it out there to the universe or to friends who aren't using them or looking around 
and get extra trays because when you buy them the two trays is really not enough to scale up so I've been fortunate to find a lot of these over the years so um, in the top there is like the active tray and where I'm filling with food waste then underneath that's all the castings and yeah, the busy worms doing the things. That's had a cow patty in there, so they're really loving it. And then, so with the extra trays, you can get, um, you can have your worms just finishing off the trays properly. So there's still castings in there. And then by the time you get to the bottom, the castings should be well and truly ready. And then even the, again, the last one, you'll find that the, 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 the worms will start building a colony down in the bottom and that's why I always take the plug out. If you leave the tap in there, often they can get, that, we forget to check it and that'll all fill up with water and flood and um, drowns your worms out. So take that out, you get your, your water dripping through and then just keep tipping it back through. So. Yeah, just, just keep on tipping it back through because they love it really wet. Now to harvest, I'm going to take some of that castings. I'll take some from here too. So you can see when I gather it up, there'll be worms in there. And sometimes there can be, you know, it, uh, partially decomposed shells or big seeds like avocado, which I don't want in the inside the, in my soil. So I'm going to get the roughly harvest some castings from there there's like super duper quality castings there like but again it's full of worms so i don't want to drown my worms in my magic potion so what we do is we make a tea bag and this here i, I would argue is you can't buy fertilizer like this because it's 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 alive with microbes and um Worm castings, yeah, they're, the, the research has shown they're just really excellent uh, source of um, all of the trace elements and, and major plant nutrients. So we're going to take that. I'll just put that on there. Um, right up front, uh, I guess the, the best analogy, the simplest analogy for what we're going to do now is make a flooding event. And as we know, floodplains traditionally have historically been really excellent locations for um, agriculture and civilizations have flourished along some of the, the, the best, the biggest floodplains in, around the globe. So we've got fresh water here, rainwater. And that's, that's what we need. We need water to water our garden. But um, when we to, to fertilize our garden, we can use that, take that rainwater and jazz it up with, and create a flooding event. The first thing that we are um, going to do is take this, some rock dust, which is um, volcanic, of a volcanic origin. So basalt, uh, crushed basalt, that really is a kind of a waste product of the larger aggregates that are, um, and we want to turn it into rock milk. So if you have a look at, when I, as soon as I put this in, the water's now changing to this really milky, um, yeah, colour. And what we've got there is tight suspended particles of rock. They're tiny little particles. Um, just like milk is has suspended solids in it, this water now has got suspended rock particles and so it's a colloidal rock product. They're small enough that when we put them into the soil, the microbes can start breaking them down. As it turns out, if you have a look up paramagnetic rocks, basalt is very highly paramagnetic and when soil tests are done at the laboratory at the uni at Southern Cross Uni and others, they test for the paramagnetism of your soil. Highly paramagnetic soils are highly productive. So we've got our rock in there. It's kind of like what comes off a glacier. So think of the healthy Hunzas and um, their gardens, their, their agriculture is very, is you know, some of the best agriculture in the world. Over here, I've collected some soil from the floodplain. So I go down, I'm on a hill, I'll go down the road to the floodplain and with all the rain, 
all the rocks and soils are washing out and depositing on the floodplain. So I'm mimicking that by harvesting some of this and bringing it back up the hill and putting it on my soil. If you, I've also read, read that, you know, even along the Nile, farmers will do that. They'll go and harvest the floodplain sediments and bring them up the hill a little bit to improve their soil. So now we've got, I don't want to stick that in my soil because it's too sticky and hard to distribute, but now I've got colloidal clay. So I'm going to pour that one in. And now it's starting to look like a flooding event. So we've got tiny particles of rock, tiny particles of clay, and um, but we can, we can, uh, so the next bit we want to add is then organic matter. So back to our beautiful decomposed food waste uh, um, from the worm farm, worm castings. I've got worms and bits of un, fully, uh, bits of food waste that's not fully broken down. So again, make a tea bag and it's kind of, going to turn into a chocolate a hot chocolate now <laughs> and you can see the colors changing and I can squeeze out there goes a spider I can squeeze out most of the the casts without losing the worms and this is what's called vermi wash so far far richer than the liquid that's just dripping out of your worm farm use the castings to make a like a literally a super duper fertilizer for your garden you could, you could just use that alone and it would be wonderful. And in all of the worm casts, there's like millions, gazillions of microbes. So it's truly living fertilizer. And if we can have a quick look at that. Um, still haven't got it all, but I've still got my worms there. So I can put them back into the worm farm. What, with all the microbes in there, we can then um, feed them up a bit. So. I've got some liquid seaweed here and I've got some liquid fish emulsion. The general rule for these kind of um, inputs is 1%. So 1% of your water, maximum 1% of these inputs. So there's 100 litres. I could put a whole litre of it in, but that's going to be a lot and it's going to add up, be quite expensive. So we use the law of a little bit and um, I'm just going to put a 250 mils of the fish emulsion. It's about there, is it? Yep, that looks good. Yeah, and then I'm going to do, I'll do 250 mils of the seaweed. And so that's like half a percent of of a hundred, so 500 mils, um, one, 100 litres, so it's about half a percent. So that's going in. And the seaweed is good for fungal, fungal food, and the, and the, as well as bacteria, and the fish emulsion is excellent for bacteria. So we've given the bacteria that's in there some food as well. Plus it's in a form that's going to be quickly taken up by the plants. So with that, I can just get my watering can, so I'll go and grab that. You know, in, during the growing season, like the peak where th things are a bit quite dormant now, I think at least once a month would be um, wise to do this. That I can, I like to um, take the, the, the rows off and just use my fingers so I can just control it and then just give enough in proportion to the size of the plant. So if that was a giant cabbage, then I'll be giving it a lot more. Over here, yeah, where the garden's in full sun. So yeah, I can start to flood around here, flood around the base, and um, yeah, and give give all the plants a good water. I would, I would probably pre-water the garden first, if it needed watering, and then like the day before or during that week, make sure the garden's had a good water, which it has because of the rain, and then um, then give it a, a feed. So all the, the nutrients in this and all the life in it is close to the, the plant root ball. Yeah. What do you call this mix, Dan? Oh, the magic potion. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that kind of evolved out of the school program, this magic potion. And that magic potion, how it evolved was that we were using that in our worm lasagna, the no dig, because what we found was that often the straw and lucerne bales that we were using, you'd open them up and they'd be dusty and spores going everywhere, so it's not at all safe for us as adults or the kids, so we realised we need to dunk it in the water, and then bit by bit we started jazzing the water up, and as we learnt more and more about, um, yeah, how to improve soils and plant health, you can take the, that rainwater to like a tonic for the soil, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I wonder how far does that go, the 100 litres? Uh, so for this size garden, I, I, I use the big drum over there that's a 500 litre uh, tub. So I'll, put, I'll do about 300 litres and do one big batch and I can, I can do the, pretty much the garden there. I reckon 500 litres would be kind of more than enough for a garden this or a bit bigger. I've got a few new beds over there. So just say every bed was under production. Uh, this is, just say that was 10 litres. I could probably use another one or two on here. So I might do 30 litres per bed. So like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, at least 10 there. So 10 times 30, yeah, 300 litres. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, the trick, the idea would be to have a like a thousand litre drum, like one of those IBCs, mix it all up, then gravity flow it somehow and have like your, your tape through the garden and just, that would be in the long run. I'd like to kind of set up that because it can be quite time consuming or physically demanding. And so if we can remove those barriers then anyone can do it, everyone can do it, yeah. So. Or even a little pump, you know, just get a hose on there and that would be the ideal, just, just attach the pump yeah. with a hose to the IBC, do a 500 litre batch or 300, whatever, go out and just water the garden and just spray it all over and, you know, go to town with it, you know, and I reckon people's gardens will just, you know, just they'll just jump out of the ground. <laughs> Fantastic. You've shared so much with us in this session today. Thank you so much, Dan. I wonder just as a... like. If someone was wanting to get started and they were just beginning, what would be your three top tips to help someone get going? I'd say start start with one square metre. Just give one square metre a go and start with the ground that you're working on. So don't worry about importing anything. Just strip the grass off and dig the soil and shape up a little, you know, little mound like this. And then number three, um, sow a test crop. Just Just plant anything and see what happens and then let the plants be your um, textbook because the colour of the leaves, the, the, sh the vitality of the crop this, of that plant will tell you the calibre of your soil. And you'll, you might have a super soil that doesn't really need much or you might have one that's a struggle soil like here we've got this papaya here, that's what happens on this soil. This soil can't grow papayas, there's just not enough calcium in it. So that's a good indicator of what's going on in the soil. So the plants will tell us what soil we've got and then we'll know where to where to go to from there. Fantastic. Mm. Well thank you Dan. In the in the show notes down below we'll include any of the links that you've talked about and, yeah. and also to the living classroom.